September 21st, 2017, and wee Sam, also known as Sam, was dropping off his two kids to school. Usually this wouldn't seem strange that a father was dropping his kids off, but where was his nanny, who usually dropped the kids off every morning? After dropping the kids off at school, he is seen purchasing some supplies at his local co-op convenience store before making his way home. That afternoon, he set up a bonfire in his back garden and started a barbecue making chicken for the family when they got home. The neighbours started to get worried as the bonfire was quite near to their fence and it was emitting this horrible smell. So one of his neighbours called the police. When the police arrived at the house of Sabrina and Sam, they went into the garden and saw Sam burning a suitcase. When they asked him what was inside, he just said it was a sheep carcass that he had found. However, one of the policemen recognised the smell. After putting out the fire, they checked the bonfire and they found something so horrific. They found a dead body. Hi, my name's Sarah Jade and welcome to my channel where we talk about true crime, unsolved cases, solved cases and more. Now let's get into this week's case. Sabrina was born in 1983 in Algeria and grew up with her mum in Paris. There's not much known about her childhood, but at the age of 18 she got a summer job at a sweet stall at the local fair. While working the stall one day, she met Sam. They hit it off straight away and this is where their on and off relationship started it would span over 17 years. Throughout those years they would break up and get back together and during that time Sabrina would see other men and one of these times resulted in her son. When Sabrina was 26 years old her and Sam moved to London. Sabrina worked as a nanny, a makeup artist and wannabe fashion designer while Sam worked in a French bank. Soon Sabrina started working for a telecommunications multi-level marketing company selling their services. One day in 2011, while Sabrina was at NatWest Bank talking to a manager, she was introduced to Mark Walton. Mark was a bit of a celebrity. He'd been a founding member of the boy band Boyzone and also set up his own band Blue while working for other stars such as Lady Gaga and Jennifer Lopez. Mark was immediately smitten by Sabrina and it was love at first sight. They agreed to meet up again, which Mark thought was a date but it turned out to be a network marketing meeting. Still not deterred, Mark signed up to help Sabrina and soon their relationship turned romantic. They started to talk on the phone every day and see each other every night and soon they moved into an apartment where Mark was paying the rent. It wasn't long before Mark saw the other side of Sabrina. She used to have these violent mood swings and she used to lash out at him at anything. Obviously, mood swings that used to give me a bit of a scare, but nothing to the level of what, what I've heard. She would get violent at any little thing, and even punched him once for snoring too loud. They were paying for nannies to look after her son. However, she was convinced that they were all sleeping with Mark. She would put cameras all around the house to watch them, convincing herself there was something going on. After 14 months together, Sabrina fell pregnant. Although their relationship was quite rocky, Mark was very happy. A few months into her pregnancy, Sabrina had to go back to France to look after her sick mum. When she was over there, she rang Mark and said, I've had a miscarriage and just hung up the phone. He was obviously very distraught, but later found out that it wasn't true and she went on to have her son. However, no one knows who the father was. Sabrina and Mark stayed together for about two years when eventually Sabrina left Mark just two days before he moved to LA. He continued to pay her rent and send her thousands of pounds and asked her to take a paternity test. However, she never got back to him and after hearing nothing from her, he decided to cut off all financial supports. This infuriated Sabrina and she used to phone up all his clients and make up all these horrible stories about him. She would phone the police around 30 times accusing him of assault, attacking his animals and all these different stories when none of them were true. After a while Sabrina rekindled her relationship with Sam 
and soon forgot about Mark. They were living in the £900,000 house that she had got with Mark and she was trying to break into the fashion industry. She was going to all the London and Paris fashion shows and trying to get a charity to set up a show for her in London. They were living in Southfield, London at the time and the community was very close. However, they described Sabrina as a very attractive young lady who had a glamorous lifestyle and wasn't the sort of person that would get involved in the community or the school associations. Due to her busy lifestyle, she decided to get a nanny. Sophie Leonette, aged 20, came from a small town in northeast France called Troy and was a quiet, gentle, spoken, lovely young lady. Her family described her as shy and reserved, but happy and always smiling. She had been looking forward to moving to England to broaden her horizon and learn English. She loved art, cinema, skating and working with children. Sabina Au Pair seemed the perfect job for her. As she was unable to get a job in her hometown, she decided to move to London. Sophie moved to London and moved in with Sabrina and Sam to look after the children. Sophie wasn't the type of girl to go out clubbing or go and see her friends and her job was her life. So soon she became the full-time carer for the children, taking them to school, dropping them off, doing their homework, cleaning for them and doing their dinners. Sabrina welcomed this into her house as it gave her the chance to work on her business. As Sophie was living with the family, it soon turned into early mornings and late evenings and she was working all the time and soon became quite isolated in the house. And Sabrina took advantage of her kind nature. In 2016, things took a turn for the worse. Sabrina started to exhibit signs of paranoia and started to fixate on her ex-boyfriend Mark again. She would come up with these outlandish accusations against Sophie, saying that her and Mark were in a relationship. Sophie was so confused and she didn't understand where all these lies were coming from. And as she didn't speak English very well, she was a bit confused about what she was saying. But she couldn't understand because Mark didn't even live in the same country as them. As Sabrina's fixations started to get worse, so did the living conditions for Sophie. They stopped paying her and told her she couldn't communicate with anyone on the outside. Sabrina started to tell people that Sophie had been planted in a house by Mark and she was helping Mark break into a house and abuse them. Mark, however, was living in a different country in LA and didn't know any of this was going on. After a few months of living with the family, Sophie was working 80 hours a week, was given little or no food and was a victim of modern day slavery. Sophie was trapped in a cycle she didn't know how to get out of. She had no friends or family to talk to. And as she was in a different country, her phone didn't really work, so she had no contact with her family. Sabrina also took her passport, so she had no way of getting home. Soon, Sophie was only allowed to leave the house to pick up and drop off the kids. And when anyone saw her, she looked sad, didn't talk to anyone, and was always wearing the same old clothes. Unbelievably, at the time, there was no rules or regulations in the UK to check up on au pairs. As the UK was part of the EU, they were part of the Freedom of Movement Act, which meant that nobody knew she was in the country. There was no regulations and no one came to check on her, which meant that her treatment flew under the radar. Sabrina soon started to interrogate Sophie on a regular basis. You will not go back to France until you've told me the truth. I'm going to spoil your life as you have spoiled mine. She would turn violent towards her and was trying to get a confession out of her about her relationship with Mark. I will not leave you alone until you tell me the truth. Is this clear? Do you understand? Strangely, due to Sam's fascination with Sabrina, he bought into all of her lies. She would coerce him and tell him all these lies and he would just believe it. This created the perfect storm, as this gave Sabrina the confirmation that her lies were true. Over the next year, the interrogations and beatings just got worse. Carefully, about 40 years in prison. Close your eyes for one minute, okay? Imagine yourself every day in a cage like an animal. And soon, Sophie's appearance changed drastically as she was starved, beaten, kept inside the house. Sabrina started to film the interrogations on her phone 
which went on for about eight hours. She would continually ask her about her relationship with Mark and when she didn't get the answer she wanted, she would beat her. Sophie would always say that it was untrue and she didn't know where these lies were coming from, but Sabrina never believed her. Sophie knew she was in danger and was trying to find a way out. She eventually was able to write a letter to her father telling him that she was scared and the family were intolerable to live with. Her mum sent a plane ticket over to her to allow her to come home. However, it was intercepted by Sabrina and as she had her passport as well, she had no way of getting home. In August 2016, things moved up another level. Sabrina would interrogate Sophie for over 12 days. She would shout and scream at her and violently abuse her. And it was all about her relationship with Mark. She believed that she'd been planted in the house and knew everything about Mark and where he was. During this time, Sam played the good cop. He would tell her, just tell her where he is, just tell her the truth, and it would all be okay. Sabrina was so delusional, she believed that she was the victim. She thought that Sophie and Mark were going behind her back and doing all these horrible things to her, when in fact, none of it was true. During those 12 days of interrogation, they were trying to beat a confession out of her. They would beat her and waterboard her to try and get her to sign a confession note. Eventually, Sophie couldn't take it anymore and signed the confession paper. She thought if she just told her this lie and signed the paper, that would be the end of it and that would be the end of her ordeal. However, it was furthest from the truth. Sabrina put her in the bath and proceeded to drown her. What's even worse is that they had sex just a few feet from where her dead body was. After her death, they knew they had to get rid of the body. So they came up with a plan. They put her body in a suitcase and while Sabrina went out to work, Sam went to the shop and bought some supplies for a barbecue. He then came back, set up a bonfire and started to burn her body on the bonfire. He set up a barbecue and cooked chicken to disguise the smell. However, the smell was too strong and one of the neighbours called the police. A few hours later, after picking up the children, Sabrina returned home, where she was arrested and brought in for questioning. During her interrogation, she didn't even know Sophie's second name and told them she didn't know where she was. She said that she had left a couple of days ago and didn't know where she was. However, all her stuff was found hidden in their shed. Although Sophie's body was burnt, they were able to see signs of torture. They found five cracked ribs and a broken breastbone. They also found a letter in her bedroom saying, why me? I need help to stop them. At first, Sam took all the blame and Sabrina was happy to pin it all on him. However, he soon changed his mind and told them the whole truth. They also found the interrogation footage on Sabrina's phone. She had actually kept the footage as she believed showing this to the police would prove that Sophie had done something wrong. They were both found guilty of murder and received a minimum of 30 years. Sam tried to appeal his sentence, but was unsuccessful. They also both tried to appeal the minimum sentences, but again were unsuccessful. It also turned out that Sabrina's lifestyle was all a lie. She had been surviving on Mark's handouts and benefits, and actually when he stopped the payments, she had racked up over £20,000 of unpaid rent. Mark Walton is traumatised by Sophie's death. Even though he had nothing to do with it, he was in a different country and it was all in Sabrina's head, he feels somewhat to blame. Interview. You said that actually you carry this with you. This is a horrible burden for you because, you know, as Charlotte said at the opening of this interview, you've been sucked into a nightmare and it was in your name yeah. that these grotesque and in the end murderous assaults were being committed. Yeah. Whenever, whenever I, I've said to friends and family, like, you know, I had to spend the rest of my life, and as you mentioned, I have said it in the newspaper as well, that there's a certain responsibility you feel when your name was the name why someone got tortured and put through something so horrific that you could never imagine. But obviously people who know me and love me say, listen, you can't blame yourself. This was two psychopaths that went and done something. It could have been so something else that they look for a reason to do this. But unfortunately for me, it was my name that got brought into this. But the hardest thing for me going to bed at night 
was knowing that that girl was telling the truth every time that she was answering those questions and them interrogations. Well, she never met me. Sophie's family are haunted by her death, but want to remember the happy girl that she was that always had a smile on her face. Thank you for watching, and if you like this video, be sure to check out this one, which goes through the cough medicine murderer. Thank you for watching, take care, and I'll see you in the next one. You call me a saint, but you know I'm a stranger, a willing and able.